I spend a lot of time thinking about game design, as you could probably tell from the content of this channel. And while it's near and dear to my heart, I think everyday people find it intimidating. Though games are simple enough to be played by literal children, the actual designs are intricate little puzzle boxes of interlocking pieces. Easy to understand, but seemingly impossible to come up with on your own. How do you design a game from the ground up? How do designers go from an idea about colonies to settlers of Catan? From intergalactic warfare to cosmic encounter, or world domination, to risk. Normally on this channel, we approach that question by speculating on future design, or by analyzing the design of an existing game. But today, I want to do something different. I want to pull back the curtain of game design by looking at a game of my very own. Shoots and Strawberries is a simple, family-friendly print-and-play game I designed over the course of a weekend and completed to start to finish in about a week. Due to both its simple nature and limited scope, it provides an ideal example of how games are born, from the barest spark of an idea all the way through to coming up with the rules, the playtesting, and all the rest. If you're curious about how the game is played, you can check out our last video in which I explain the rules. And if you want to pick up a print and play copy of your very own, you can do so over at itch.io, link in the description. So get comfortable grab a beverage, and let's talk about game design. How to come up with ideas is a common question you often see from creatives early in their journey. It's one of those fun gulfs between the experienced and the inexperienced. When you're starting out as a creator, ideas are these impossible divine sparks of inspiration, the mystical fruit of a hidden tree. But when you're an old, grizzled writer or designer, you have literally hundreds, if not thousands, of ideas you're never going to get to less like fruit and more like weeds. We couldn't get rid of them if we tried. So where did this specific idea come from? Where did I get the inspiration to make a game of dice and dominoes and agricultural futures? Well, it came from two pretty unlikely places. The first being my writing, and the second being a YouTube video. Let me explain. I have this bad habit of writing scenes where the characters sit around playing some board game. There's one in Trial of Atlas and another in Eye of Sill. While working on a new book, the next in the Silmanara series, I started to come up with one of those scenes and wanted a new game for it. In Sill, games have a convention of mixing two components. So Chits is a game like poker with a hand of cards and rolling dice, and Knights and Knaves is a game of tactics like Warhammer or chess, but in which the units are random, drawn from pooled lots in the middle of the table. These games don't exist, they're just window dressing. So I wanted a new game made of two components that I hadn't used before. I started with dice because who doesn't like dice and thought, now what? I can't do cards because I already did that with chits. What else is random? Dominoes? Dominoes are basically just a marriage of cards and dice. Why not mix those together? Yeah, dice and dominoes. It's even alliterative. Components themselves aren't really an idea. They're half an idea. What do these components do? How do they interact with one another? And more importantly, what do they represent? What is this game about? Maybe it's because I used to work at USDA, or maybe I was just hungry, but something about the pattern of five dots on a domino got me thinking about crops, specifically new crops. Shoots. Shoots and strawberries to keep it alliterative. Okay, so now we have this idea of a game about dice and dominoes, and it deals with crops somehow. The real kicker is that by the time I figured all of this out, 
I realized what a bad habit it was to keep putting these scenes in my books and scrapped it altogether. I cut the scene before even writing it, never bothering to put word to page and forgetting about this game idea all together. A couple of days later, I'm watching a Shut Up and Sit Down video. They've been covering board games since forever. I actually discovered their channel way back when they were two videos on Vimeo, which I found through StumbleUpon, of all things. In this particular video, the host was trying their damnedest to make yet another Euro game sound interesting, to get people hooked on the theme so they'd stick around for the rules explanation. Now, I am not one for worker placement games. I find them to be a little on the dull side, and it bugs me that their mechanics so rarely match their theming. They feel like someone designed a fully functional game and then just slathered some random theme over top of it. So I'm watching this video and I'm zoning out thinking about worker placement games and I remember my idea for this dice domino crop simulator. And I ask myself a simple question. The question all design originates from. How would that work? We've got dice and we've got dominoes and we've some vague notion of strawberries. How are we going to make these things interact? How do we take this inspiration and turn it into design? We could focus on our theme, this idea of planting crops and work backwards, or we could take a closer look at our components and work forwards. The crops part is pretty easy. All of these farming games basically default to the crops equaling points of some kind. So we can be pretty sure the goal of this game will revolve around getting the most props. And then we've got our dice and dominoes to think about. Those components are nearly identical. Two random generators rolled or flipped to display a number. So if these components are effectively duplicates of one another, why do we need them both? How are these two components going to intersect to create something unique that we couldn't get from either alone? While the dominoes display a number, we're really using them to generate crops. I pull a domino, it tells us how many crops we got. But how many dominoes are we pulling? Any flat number is going to be pretty predictable. So what if we use the randomness of the dice to offset that. We roll the dice, generating a number that tells us how many dominoes to pull out of a bag. And then the dominoes generate a number of strawberries. And you know, they make dominoes with different colored dots. So we can use those dots not just to represent differing amounts of crops, but different crops all together. It was with this vague idea that I went to bed on a Friday night and woke up Saturday morning determined to turn it into an actual game. In order to do that, I would need two things, structure and decisions. These are the fundamental forces of the gaming universe, the gravity and magnetism of gaming physics. Without structure, a game is formless, the random playing of children without cause or reason. Without decisions, games are soulless, preordained simulations with an obvious outcome. The fun within a game comes from the decisions we make within the established structure, our triumphs and defeats within the boundaries dictated by the designer. Just like theming and components, we can approach this design challenge logically from both ends, the structure side and the decision side. And just like our components, we should be doing both simultaneously. Structure, we already have a line on. We know we're going to roll some dice and pull some dominoes out of a bag. So where's the decision? Why do I, the player, care about how many dominoes or the dots written on them? So far, all we have are a couple of random number generators and a loose theme, not a game. The most common way of gamifying randomness is with betting. It's as old as human civilization. And again, our theme helps guide us. Betting on how many crops sprout in a given season is an industry upon itself. Back when I worked at USDA, NAS had to release their world supply and demand estimates in a sealed setting 
the same way you would do a classified briefing, because even minor differences in crop outputs could result in huge swings on the commodity markets. As a total aside, those briefings are actually pretty cool. I got to attend two of them in person. If you ever get the chance, I recommend it. I'll link to their YouTube channel below. All right, so let's take this real world concept of supply and demand and fold it back into our game. By using the dots to represent an amount and the color to represent a crop, we can establish a value for those crops. The more dots there are of a given crop, the cheaper they become. One strawberry costs five each, but five strawberries only cost one each. This raises several new questions, with every answer bringing us closer to the game's ultimate design. Strawberries cost five what? Dollars? Pumpkins? Souls of the damned? How does a player even pay for them? And if this is supposed to be a game about betting, what differentiates one bet from another? What separates the performance of different players? How does someone win? We're going to need money, that's easy to do, and the players will use that money to buy crops. The crops equal points, most points wins. And it'll be the betting that bridges this gap. At this point, we don't have a game, but we do have the impression of one. But in order to really nail things down, we're going to need that second major component, structure. We already have some of the pieces we need to solve this problem, and we can use basic logic to arrange them. We know that paying for crops has to come after the dominoes are pulled from the bag, and we know the rolling of the dice has to come before the dominoes are pulled. The question is, where does betting go? Do we put it before the die roll or after? Well, what makes the more interesting decision? If we put the betting before the die roll, the player doesn't have any information to act on. That's not a bet, that's a guess. And guessing is less fun. But rolling the die first and then betting gives the player information about the future, of how many dominoes are coming out of the bag. This gives their decisions structure, and it helps us break up our two random number generators for greater effect. By arranging all these pieces in order, we get the structure for our game. Players are gonna roll a die, and that die determines how many dominoes come out of a bag. They'll place bets on what those dominoes will show. The dominoes will have dots on them, which establish values for crops the players then pay for according to their bets. We can establish each of these steps as their own phase and tie all the phases together into a round. This is functional, but is it fun? That is a much more challenging question to answer. And as much as we now know about the shape of our game, it is far from complete. In order to keep pushing forward, we're going to have to sit back and think through it. We'll need to imagine what the players are going to do step by step from start to finish. This will not only cause us to encounter questions we haven't anticipated, but it will help us flesh out the decisions the players are going to make along the way. Our first phase is for the player to roll dice, but how many? What kind? 2d6? 3d8? Even a single six-sided die means we could end up pulling six dominoes out of the bag. That's a lot of dominoes, way too many. We're gonna need a smaller number. We could use a coin, a 1d2, but that means a maximum of two, and that feels too small. Three seems like a good number, a magic number, if you will, but 1d3s don't really exist. We could roll a d6, divide by 2, but then we're adding math for no real reason. We could roll a d4 and ignore the result of a 4, treat it like another 3, but that's not exactly exciting. If I'm a player and I roll a 4, only to be told it counts as a 3, I'm going to be disappointed. So what if instead we make the 4 do something cool, like give the players more money? This adds some extra randomness, helps one playthrough feel different from another. And we can say it gives the player $4 when rolling a 4, because that's easy to remember. Then we get to the next phase, betting. And we're gonna have to tread 
carefully here. There's a lot of possibility space, a lot of paths we could go down. Additionally, the bedding is the main crux of the action, the load-bearing wall or support beam of our game, so we need to get it right. Our domino generator makes two things, an amount and a type of crop. So those are the things players are going to be betting on. And we'll need different values for those crops, depending on their type and amount, to differ those outcomes from one another. Otherwise, the player would be betting on duplicate results. So I whip up this little table. Now it looks complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. We start with our strawberries, which we already decided are going to get cheaper the more there are. They start at $5 a dot and get cheaper until $1 at five or more dots. We add in that little five plus as a safety net to catch all those edge cases. Then we make blueberries, the opposite of our strawberries. This makes our math more interesting and we make them blueberries because blue is the opposite of red. This makes two crops that are volatile. So we want something a little more predictable, something with a flat number. So we make cabbages at $1 across the board. This establishes a safe bet if you're skittish or low on money, but betting only cabbages won't be enough to win. Now we have a stable crop in cabbages and two sharp crops in strawberries and blueberries. So let's add two more, carrots and potatoes, which will be more volatile but shallow. Notice I'm just taking the existing math of one through five dots and one through five dollars and mixing them in different ways. We're looking for all of the interesting possibilities within the defined space rather than expanding that space to find something else. Looking at a table, even a well-organized table, can make it difficult to visualize this math, which is why at this point I made this terrible little graph. It shows me a visual representation of these ranges, and it also highlights that we're missing one. We have a floor in cabbages, but no ceiling. So I add lemons at $5 a piece to help round things out. This is going to solve a flaw in the design we don't even know is there yet. With a better understanding of our crops, we can figure out how these bets will actually be made, how they will be worded. Because this is the main way the player is interacting with the game, we want to offer them as much freedom as possible within the structure we've previously established. Letting them bid on specific crops if they want to be conservative makes sense, and we can give them another avenue of control by allowing them to cap that bet at a specific number, so three strawberries or two carrots or whatever. And it's here that lemons save our asses before we even know our asses needed saving. Player who insisted on buying two of any crop or three of any crop would stand a good chance of picking up crops on the cheap. The only real danger would be blueberries and they're only dangerous in small numbers. By adding lemons, we put in a trap for risky players. Betting two of any now carries a very real danger of paying $10 for only two lemons. This adds an upper boundary to a playstyle in the same way that cabbages add a lower. Overly conservative players who play it safe by only betting on cabbages are going to get outpaced by players making bigger bets, and players swinging for the fences every round are going to find themselves quickly out of money due to spending a fortune on lemons. We know from earlier that after players lock in their bets, they pull dominoes out of the bag, but what comes next? What do they actually do with these dominoes? Do they eat them? Do they throw them at one another? We're going to need some structure here, ideally one that leads the player to make an interesting decision. Dominoes, the component, helps us out here because they come from their own game with a pre-existing placing mechanic of placing matching numbers against one another. By using dominoes, we not only inherit this design, we inherit the player's preconceptions. They are going to assume our dominoes work this way before they have even sat down at the table. That doesn't mean we have to do it that way, but it does mean we get it for free. 
add in our colors, and we give the players two options, placing like numbers to like numbers, or like colors to like colors. Once the dominoes are placed, we have to figure out how they are scored. What crops count and don't count for what the players are paying? Again, we use the dominoes. Any domino placed illegally that round gets scored, simple enough. Okay, so what happens when a domino can't be placed illegally? Does it get discarded? Does it go back in the bag? Why don't we just leave it? Just place it off to the side. That way it can be used in future rounds, adding to the play space rather than being subtracted from it. For each of these steps, each of these problems, we examine them from a standpoint of what makes things simple while also making things fun. What provides structure for the player while also giving them interesting decisions to make? So long as we look at these problems through that lens, we're going to come up with something that is fun and interesting for the player. The fifth phase of players ponying up the cash and getting tokens for the crops they bought is effectively cleanup. It makes sure all the consequences of the round are tallied and that the play field is reset for the next one. By fleshing out each of these phases in turn by thinking through the actions and decisions of the player, we now know far more about our game than when we started. We have the terrain of this game, both the decisions and the structures, thoroughly mapped out. It means it's time to record it. Everyone thinks the game they are designing will be fun, easy, intuitive, and exhilarating. It's easy to fool ourselves when they only exist as concepts in our head, no matter how detailed that concept is. Putting them down on paper, turning the conceptual into the concrete, forces us to face the thorny tangles and unseen obstacles that could trip us up. After doing all that work to figure out the design and structure of our game, we have to actually sit down and write it all out to make sure these seemingly intuitive rules can be recorded and conveyed in a way understood by people other than ourselves. This can be challenging in more ways than one, and it's why most games never make it past this stage. Thankfully, there are tried and true methods for how to go about this. Writing, whether fiction or nonfiction, and I think I've written enough of both to make declarative statements like this, is built around the idea of laying out ideas in a logical manner. So they build one on top of the other in order to reach some ultimate conclusion. In fiction, we do this by setting up characters, their motivations, and relationships to reach some powerful emotional beat. In nonfiction, we layer foundational concepts gradually working towards more complex ideas until we've convinced someone of our argument, teaching addition and subtraction before moving on to multiplication and division so that by the time we get to algebra, the student is ready for it. The rules and instructions for games, be they video or traditional, are the same. We need to structure our document in such a way that the player is guided through its concepts, starting with the simple and building to the complex until they feel confident enough to play the game themselves. We start with an introduction, giving the player an idea of what they are getting into. For board games, it's common to include a list of components, not only to make sure they haven't lost anything, but to further define the conceptual space of the game. We then go through each chunk of the rules, building one atop the other until reaching final scoring and how to win, the uh, conclusion of this particular document, just like all those five paragraph essays you had to write in school. And again, the structure of our game guides the way. Because the game progresses logically, each phase building off the phase that came before it, so will the document if we simply explain each phase in order. Formatting the book this way also makes it more usable during play, as players can follow along with the rulebook when playing, or know roughly where a given section is if they have to look up a specific rule. Now, at this stage, we aren't worried about layout or images or any of that. This is just raw words on a page, closer to a detailed outline or design document than something the public is ever going to see. 
We can add in all those visual bells and whistles later. Writing the rules down also forces us to examine details of the game we've ignored up till now. If the game is structured in rounds and phases, what constitutes those terms? Where does the money come from, the bank or a given player? Do we need to explain the board game concept of a bank, or can we trust that they've played Monopoly before? How much money do they get? Who goes first? What does the board look like when we begin play? Are their dominoes already placed, or is it blank? These questions, while annoying, are good because answering them is going to further flesh out our design, making it more robust and closer to final form. And we find those answers based on our core principles of decisions and structure, of thinking through what is most interesting for the player. Having a blank board to start with would be pretty boring, given our placement mechanic. If dominoes can only be scored by placing them against other dominoes, starting the game with an empty board means round one would have no action. There'd be nothing to place the dominoes against. So to maximize the chance of something happening, we start the game with three dominoes on the board, giving the player something to actually do on the first round. Now, starting money might seem intimidating. It's easy to get wrapped up in balance and in-game economies and stress about the right number, but none of that matters. The important thing is to get something on the board so we can test it. Just pick a number, any number. If in playing the game, which we'll get to, you find it too low, you can raise it. And if it's too high, you can lower it. In this particular instance, I went with $50 in starting cash. I arrived at that number because dominoes are one through five dots, making a rough spend of $5 per round sound reasonable, and I figured the game would last 10 rounds. Five bucks per round for 10 rounds, $50 in starting cash. There are two more things writing the rules down forces us to contend with. The first is, how does this game end? When will we know we have finished, that the ride is concluded and we can go in search of other fun? Again, we just think through the problem logically. Go until everyone runs out of money or reaches a certain score or a certain number of rounds have passed. The important part is that the end condition is concrete and as far from random as we can get. We want this to be a boundary on the play space to add additional structure. The second thing it forces us to contend with is clarity. Do our rules actually make any sense? Can they be conveyed simply and accurately to someone else with little room for misinterpretation or error? This might sound easy, but there are many a game mechanic people have dreamed up in their heads only to realize it makes absolutely no sense on paper. We've got our idea, and we turn that idea into a design, and we've written that design down in a way that it can be logically and consistently followed. You may think this is the end of the road. After all, we have the rules. The game can be played, it technically exists, but that does not mean it's finished. Dough is technically bread, but you wouldn't eat it. We need an oven to stick this bad boy into, and that oven is called playtesting. It's kind of a weird metaphor, but I think it works. Playtesting is the next great pit our design can be lost in. It's where a lot of travelers wander off the road. The first mistake people make when playtesting their design is going off their memory rather than the rules. We just spent all that time writing the rules down so they could be logically followed, but people will happily sit there playing the game from memory and congratulating themselves on how brilliant they are. Sitting down and playing the game according to your rules that you wrote down is going to A, make you realize how poorly you wrote them down in the first place, and B, will force you to realize all the things you forgot to add the first time around. For example, for shoots and strawberries, I realized in the first playtest that I didn't consider a player who wouldn't want to bet anything. Are bets of nothing allowed? Why or why not? I had to ask myself stupidly simple questions like, what happens when a player runs out of money? What happens when a player has bet more than they can buy? What if they bet everything? All of these things required explanations and decisions. 
The second thing playtesting forced me to contend with was the math. Turns out up to three dominoes with two sides each and up to five dots per side leads to a crapload of dots, like way, way too many dots. Also, having double-sided dominoes with the same crop on both ends further compounded that issue. I was getting numbers way, way too high, not only burning through my meager starting cash of $50 per player, but also making results that were too random. Random number generators are confined by their range, and having a domino with five dots to a side meant I was generating a number of one to 10 dots up to three times per round. I immediately realized in the first playtest I needed to clamp those numbers down tighter, so I cut the numbers way, way down. I got rid of the blank dominoes, I got rid of all the duplicates, and I cut the maximum number of dots from five to three. This locked down the randomness to something far less swingy, something the players could more easily contend with. It also meant far less dominoes had to physically be made, cutting down cost even if we are just printing these out. And finally, I realized that 10 rounds was way too many. My players were running out of money around turn six or seven. So instead of tweaking the starting cash, I just cut the number of rounds down. Makes the game speedier, adds pressure to the betting, and makes players more likely to want to play again. But playtesting still had one final rule to teach me. Playing the game wasn't fun. It worked, you could play it, but it was kind of boring. Yeah, I could make bets, but the way I had envisioned placing the dominoes meant the placing was perfunctory. Assume a simulation rather than a decision. So I made the simplest change in the world. Instead of scoring the whole domino you place, you only score half of the new domino and half of the domino it is placed against. The most minuscule of changes, but ones that had far-reaching consequences. Because now, there were tactics. Players could place dominoes in a manner maximizing their own score, while screwing over their enemies. I knew this was immediately better because it not only did it offer more decisions without having to alter the structure, it forced me to record my playtest data in a different way. Initially, I didn't record whose turn it was in the data because it didn't really matter. The dominoes that came out of the bag were going to be placed the same regardless. And this really should have been a warning light, a canary in the coal mine of the design, but I ignored it. Making this small change had such a fundamental effect on the design that I needed to record whose turn it was in order to get good data. But more importantly, it was fun. It made me, as a player, not only think about what I was betting, but what the other players were betting. It made me look at the board and ask myself how best I could use it to my advantage. One tiny change, but one that had an enormous effect on the actual enjoyment of playing it. Once you've play tested your game, making tweaks and changes as you go, you're going to get pretty confident in the result. You might even think it's ready for release, but you would be wrong. Because playtesting is not a solitary activity. You need to put the game in front of other people. People assume this is to make sure the game is fun to someone other than you. And while that's technically true, that's not why you should do it. Honestly, it doesn't matter if other people think the game is fun. It's not their game, it's yours. If you think it's fun, that's good enough. When I'm writing my books, I care if I'm happy with it, not if other people are. No, you put your game in front of other people because it's going to show you gaps in the armor you didn't know were there. Time for a brief story. Many, many moons ago, 2011, according to the dates modified in my Windows folder, Jesus, was that really 12 years ago? I have accomplished so little in my life. Let's not focus 
on that part. Point is, I made a little card game with a sort of a civilization type vibe to it. I made these little cards that I drew myself and laminated using packing tape on the front and duct tape on the back. The duct tape was functional, by the way, being printed on computer paper meant the cards were see-through. I needed a backing to block it, and duct tape was both cheap and readily available. I went to my friends and said, hey, I made a game, would you guys be cool playing it? And they were all thankfully down for whatever nonsense I came up with. They were in college at the time, so we went to their activity room and started playing. This had the added benefit of passing strangers asking if they could join in, meaning I was getting playtest data from both friends and random people with no vested stake in my feelings. This is another one of those areas where people get tripped up. You spent all this time designing a game, you're excited about it, and people actually want to play it. So the instinct is to sell it to them, to stand up at the head of the table and reveal the brilliance of your design. Do not do this. When playtesting, you need to approach it not as a showman, but as a researcher, like a photographer in a documentary. Hand them the rules in a box of components and let them do the rest. Have them actually read your rules and work through the game themselves. This will reveal all those little things you thought were obvious or forgot to add. By sitting back, you force the design to stand on its own and that distance will help you see if the game is working or not. Are the players having fun? Does the game proceed smoothly? Does the design work? And make no mistake, players having fun in the design working are not the same thing. See, when I put that card game in front of those players all those years ago, they had fun. Both my friends and the random strangers really liked the game. They were giving it genuine compliments and seemed excited to continue playing it. But I, sitting high upon my perch with my little notepad and pen, realized a problem. Not a small problem either, but one so fundamental that it basically unraveled the design. See, in this game you had cards. Some of those cards generated resources, and some of those cards cost resources to play, or damage the resources of your opponent. Think like Magic the Gathering, but where the lands are integrated and there are no creatures, sort of? Anyway, by watching other people play, I realized that so long as a player used the card with the highest number, they were probably going to win. I hadn't noticed it when designing the game because I was having so much fun building it and the players didn't notice because they were distracted by the theming. I play this card to boost my military, or I play that card to boost my energy, and so on. Those colorful icons were a smokescreen to the actual problem. So long as you played the card with the highest net benefit, you were going to outstrip your opponent. And while the players didn't notice it in that particular evening, they would have if we had kept playing. Fun or no fun, it told me I needed to go back to the drawing board. Putting your game in front of other people is an absolutely vital part of the design process. Don't skip it. <music> Concluding playtesting means you can start on draft two of your design. You can go back and tie up all those loose ends, make rules modifications, and clean up the language in your rules. This is not something you should do once. Redraft your rulebook, then throw it back into playtesting, then redraft it again. There really isn't such a thing as too much playtesting. It's really only a question of time, motivation, and money. Once you're convinced the game is done done, you can put it out there. Components are pretty easy to make these days, and you can upload it to a variety of places like itch.io, as I did with Shoots and Strawberries, or over at places like Drive Through RPG if you're building a role playing game. Like all creative endeavors, games are never really finished. Putting it out may cause other people to realize flaws the original playtesters missed. You might have to tweak some numbers or make some balance changes. The important thing is that you put it out there, sending it out into the world to sink or swim on its own merits. To allow people to play the game you put so much effort into and hopefully bring a little enjoyment into their lives. I'm Mike Laguero. 
Thanks for watching. This is likely the last video before the channel goes dark again for a while. While the channel is seeing some increased traffic, largely due to the Sims video, check that out if you haven't already, the numbers aren't currently sustainable. that numbers aren't currently sustainable. If you want to support the channel and encourage me to make more videos, consider picking up a print and play copy of Shoots and Strawberries available right now on itch.io, or consider picking up one of my books in Kindle or paperback over at Amazon or Google Play. Links in the description, and as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. And thought, now what? Shush. No. Can't do cards, already did that with chits. What else is random? Dominoes? Dominoes are basically just a marriage of cards and dice. Why not mix those together? Yeah, dice and dominoes. It's even alliterative.